Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sarah Boost, the Happiness Science Insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We're champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm your host, Lu Ngo, coming to your ears from NARM, Melbourne, Australia. Let's learn together. Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode. Now, I'm your host, Dina Sargent, and I'll be taking over for Lu today. Now, having a sense of belonging creates security in yourself. Now, when it comes to a workplace environment, it's important to have a place that fosters that inclusive space. Joining me today to explore the topic of belonging is speaker, coach, and CEO of the Precipio Company, Matthew Cahill. Thank you so much for joining me today, Matthew. Thank you, Dina, for having me. Now, there is a lot that your company looks into within the workplace that sort of tries to promote positive environment and also a sustainable environment when it comes to maintaining workplace relationships. But there's also you individually who speaks to a lot of people on building relationships in a professional and also a personal setting. So that being said, for people watching that don't know you, can you share your role in helping individuals explore their sense of belonging? Yeah, thank you for setting it up. This... um and framing it under the term belonging. Mm -hmm. I think when belonging was introduced to corporate America, it was, uh, it was introduced into a diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging context. So in America, DEI, it became, it took on a life of its own as corporations simply look to diversify, diversify everything, including people. And as many things are apt to do, belonging was introduced as a natural progression for organizations to really give people a sense of belonging. That is powerful. It's deep. It's, 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 you're tapping into a fundamental human condition that even Maslow, Abraham Maslow in his later days had said, he got it kind of wrong. Belonging is actually more powerful than the, the, than a survival instinct. So Mm -hmm. uh, belonging is not something that I take lightly. I think it's something that organizations, if they really focus on, can increase productivity, can do all of the things that they want to do to make their board of directors happy, their shareholders happy. And most importantly, they're going to keep their employees happy. Okay. So when it comes to your role specifically, what have you found to be the most common problem that sort of occurs when individuals don't feel like they fit in a workplace? Um, The most common problems, is that the question? Yes. Um, I think the number one problem is when there's a manager uh, of people who doesn't really understand how to create a sense of belonging. And that's the number one reason why people leave their jobs is their boss. Mm -hmm. And it can start with uh, something innocuous and just grow over time. Uh, It can be communication styles, personality, can be lots and lots and lots and lots of things. But that's the number one reason why uh, people leave their, their jobs. Um, other reasons why people don't feel like they belong is they're not in the right role. There's not something that really aligns with their skill sets. They're bored. They're not, they're not operating at that intersection of both challenge and reward. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think those are probably the, the top two reasons why people leave their, uh, leave their jobs. Okay. No, it's, It's really interesting because we're always talking about trying to make the company 
better or trying to improve the company. But what we, I think a lot of people forget, and I, when I was looking into this topic, I was having this whole discussion, whole debate with my entire family who all do um, freelance and who all sort of work for themselves in a way. And the reason that freelance is becoming so popular now is because you're sort of working on your own terms. You're sort of working on your own, um, you're working for people hire you to make themselves better. They don't sort of expect, bring you into a company and expect you to just automatically make everything better or make everything perfect. They hire you because they know your skill set. So I think when it comes to, and I have this conversation a lot when it comes to stability versus the freedom. And when it comes to that sense of belonging, that's a lot what freelancers are sort of missing is that sense of being in a workplace and understanding what a workplace is. And I also, like, I have this younger sister. She's done nothing. She's always done freelance since she's finished university. She's done, worked for so many different companies, but now she's going into a one company and she's actually a part of a workplace, actually work part of the workplace environment. And it's changed her whole perspective as to what has, who has her best interests at heart. Is it the company or is it her? And she loves her work, but there's also the sense of, okay, she can get overworked very quickly. So it's always a great difference between the stability of a company or the freedom for yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think it, a lot of it has to do with, you know, where you are in your own life journey. Mm -hmm. uh, I reflect back on, um, in, in my college experience at university, I was anti-fraternity. I wanted nothing to do with fraternities in a, in a Greek system in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, they were, I, 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 I believed that people who joined fraternities were just sellouts. Like they were true individuals. They didn't really know who they are. They, they were looking for some other thing to identify themselves. And, uh, it was probably 10 years later that I was talking with somebody who shared in their fraternity, they were able to, you know, gain access to professors, papers and like the previous seniors and juniors would leave things behind for the, for the new, you know, members of that fraternity to benefit from, let's say, uh, not mm -hmm. plagiarize or cheat. No, 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 that would never happen. Uh, but there was this, there was just these, all these different things that I had, I was completely oblivious to because I viewed things a certain way. And I think life kind of treats you that way when you're, when you're first starting out and you're working for a company there is a sense of belonging with that company. There's a sense of identity with that company. You can hear it when people just describe what they do. If you ask somebody, uh, I always use this as an example, it's a regional bias, but people who work at Google, Google uh, is a, a, a worldwide brand. When you say Google, I, I see your head shake. You know what Google means, like it's a, it's a thing. And they've done such an amazing job of, of marketing and branding that identity that people who work there identify as Googlers, or at least they're identified as Googlers by people who, same thing with F Facebookers, like, like people who have the, they identify with the name of the company, it becomes part of their identity. And that I think is a, a powerful force that a company can be for somebody. If you ask somebody else, like what, what do they do? And they just say, oh, I work for a, an accounting firm. You know, they don't have a strong sense of identity with that company that is their employer, that's providing the essence of the, that, that, that provides the means for the roof over their head, right? It takes care of a very fundamental need that they have to exist in the world. And, uh, and I think how you would identify with that makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a really interesting way of, of putting it, especially when you talk about the influence that Google has of like the minute that you say I work for Google, that's the minute that you really just believe that you are exactly what they are wanting, that you have the necessary skill set, that you are pretty much kind of like above and beyond than what a regular employee is, which is 
a great a great concept i think to sort of see yourself as a google i would love to work for google i will just say that now and here and now <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So because he, google execs that are listening uh look up dina dina sergeant you can find her i'll take it i'll take it uh yeah well thank you so much for that introduction and before we dive deeper into it i'd love to get to know some of your interests uh, by playing our little icebreaker game and a little get to know you questionnaire now to start off with do you have a favorite book that you are currently reading oh that's two different questions um i, I have... can go for favorite book favorite book <laughs> um my favorite book is uh oh the places you'll go by dr seuss um I read that to my children uh, when they were wee little ones. And then as they got older, it just still sticks. I still refer to it. Oh, the places you'll go. It's such a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, for work, a very seminal work, a uh, seminal uh, um, book was by a Stanford professor named Robert Sapolsky. The book is called uh, Behave Humans at Their best and worst behavior or something like that. Uh, maybe I got the title wrong, but that book uh, is was just very profound in stretching my thinking around human thought, human behavior, uh, how people engage with the world around them. And it really stretched it beyond just a singular dimension. Um, mm -hmm. So those are probably my my favorite book and then the one that was uh most recent okay i can definitely relate to the dr seuss one i can't really relate to the second book because i haven't read that but i have read dr seuss um and i actually got that as a graduation gift when i finished high school from the entire from the entire faculty they gave, each gave one of us and like a handwritten note at the front of it saying that all the places that you'll go and you'll go far. So like, that's like the most memorable moment that I have with that book because it still seemed, it still seemed possible. Everything still seems possible. Even though I'm in my mid twenties, things still seem very possible. I could wake up tomorrow and I could change my entire life or I could wake up tomorrow and I could still want to change where I want to live. So like everything, that book just reminds me that you can change your entire life in any moment that you want to. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it and that, that, that truth stays with you for your lifetime. There are things that you might, it, it may make it, it may be more challenging to, to shift and pivot and, you know, go in a different direction as you get older but it's still not impossible and uh and i think it's unfortunate because as people get older they forget you know they they forget that it, that things are still possible yeah no i think that's very true now to move on to movies do you have a movie that you have recently enjoyed oh uh, um i took my 14 year old daughter, uh, as well as my wife. And, and, uh, we went to go see the Barbie movie and, okay. um, that was, that was, uh, you know, quite, quite popular at the theaters for quite, for, for a while. And it was, um, I think, I just think it was really well done. They, uh, they took a, that seemed impossible when I heard the premise that they were going to make a, a, you know, a 90 minute to two hour movie about a doll. And somehow, like disrupt it, the, all of the stereotypes that that you know doll itself, the marketing of that doll, all of it that 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 it perpetuated over time for generations, and they did it. It was it was wonderful. It was it was just so many layers to that movie that um, I truly enjoyed it. Yeah, no, I can definitely see that. I think my favorite visual analogy is how they perceived Ken throughout the whole film is like they made him very much focused into being a boy. And then when he got into the real world, he saw so many different influences that he could have had, so many different people, so many different ways of being a man, but he fell into the one that was very much stereotypical or very much 
looked into as how, okay, this is how to be growing up. This is how you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be controlling and vindictive and all these things. And then, and then he learned that that's not how you're supposed to be, that you don't have to be that way, that there's so many different ways of so many different definitions of what getting older means. So like while I focus so much on Barbie and I love that, I also love how they looked at Ken because I think that was a very underrated analogy for me. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, it touches on the, the legacy archetypes. And, you know, when you, when you mentioned Ken, I was thinking, well, which Ken? Because it also didn't pigeonhole Ken into being, you know, a, a white male, you know, kind of surfer uh, type person. And so it, it was, it was lovely. I mean, I, I love the way they handled that because it simultaneously dismantled this very patriarchal, traditional archetype of what a man is supposed to be. Yes. No, I can definitely agree with you on that. Now, when it comes to podcasts, do you have a podcast that you are listening to at the moment? Hidden Brain. Hidden okay. Brain. Uh, the host is a, a man named Shankar Vendantham, mm -hmm. and he produces a weekly podcast. It started here in the United States on National Public Radio, on NPR, and he got so uh, successful that he's now created his own media company. And uh, now they have a subscription service. He's really taking off and uh, he's quite a, a, he's the most brilliant thinker uh, when it comes to the, the, the biases that exist in our brain, uh, the obvious and hidden biases that guide our behavior. And he gets fascinating people to, to, you know, to be featured in this podcast. And each podcast has a unique thread that it, that it just pulls and unravels and, 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 and it's just wonderful. So does it look into what we don't see about the brain? Is that what it focuses on? I, uh, yes, he has okay. a unique blend of, of psychology of, of biology, of sociology, of neuroscience, of he pulls all these different disciplines together. Wow. No, that sounds, that sounds like an incredible podcast to listen to. Definitely. It's definitely not a easy listen, but it's definitely something that I think it's probably worth listening to. I think I may have portrayed it as more dense than what it actually is. Okay. He, he is so unique because he weaves stories into every episode and he makes every story very relatable. Um, if there are dense words that you have to Google before you interview somebody, um, he, he, he takes every one of them and makes sure that they're crystal clear on like what the definitions are before they proceed. It's, it's beautiful. It's really well done. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm definitely going to listen to it, to it now on the way home today, which is good. Now, when it comes to role models, do you have a person or a group of people that you find yourself looking up to that's either can be in your professional aspect or even in a personal aspect? Oh, gosh. You know, I was, um, I was thinking about this question when I, when I saw it and, and historically I would always point to, um, a mentor that I had for years and years and years. And, um, but of late, my role model has really been other parents who, uh, you know, who have just survived raising teenagers. <laughs> and, and so there, there's both a collective, uh, as well as certain individuals that, um, have been incredibly supportive and wonderful and loving and, and, uh, and helpful over the last year or so. And, um, you know, if I think big picture, uh, you know, mother Teresa is always somebody that I doesn't, I don't think ever really gets enough credit, um, for what she, uh, contributed to the world and, and what she just represents now. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was another one that I think you know, just defined, uh, she, she is an archetype. Um, locally there's some, there's a, uh, 
there's a man here in, in San Francisco who was one of the founders of the Omega Boys Club. His name is Jack Jacqua. And he's now 80 some years old and, and uh, he's just become a tremendous friend and confidant and, and he's somebody that still spends more time in prisons advocating for people who have no rights, who have no voice. He gives, literally gives voice to the voiceless in so many contexts. And uh, I just admire him from the bottom of my heart. No, that sounds that sounds like an incredible role, role, group of role models to have and to look up to. And I feel like the world definitely has some really inspiring people that we sort of overlook or underlook. Or we don't really focus on them so much until we want to quote them for something. But there are so many different kinds of people that I think hold such a such a tool that we can't really figure out on our own, which is, which is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the penchant in, in the, the media world that we're saturated in is to find polarizing figures. So to find a true role model that you can, uh, you know, just look to for inspiration, the moment you do, it seems like they're there's somebody else that's going to try to tear them down. And that's exactly. a sad statement of the saturation that we find ourselves in. Yes. I mean, especially in this day and age where anyone can get canceled or anyone can be put down just because they have an opinion. I feel that's, it's a big world that we live in today. And I think we were speaking about this before we started recording as well. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Is this is the moment where we just go silent and just meditate for the. I think so. <laughs> we saw it now. <laughs> <laughs> now I know, especially with today's world, there's so many different ways that happiness sort of fits into our lives and maybe fits into a day to day sort of overlook. But I know that everyone has a different definition as to what happiness is. So, to your definition, what would, how would you define happiness? Overrated. Okay. Can you explain a little bit further? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know that's a very provocative word to use uh, on the happiness podcast, <laughs> but I think I've gotten more mileage out of defining uh, and seeking joy in the world. And what I find is that in, in, in modern society where an emphasis is placed on consumption, on consumer goods, on, uh, you know, more focuses on what you consume and stuff that can generate happiness, that it's become so conflated that all of us are guilty of this. We seek out something that's going to make us happy. Right. And maybe it's a lipstick, maybe it's a, a new car, maybe it's a, you know, whatever, a shiny object. And, and that's associated with happiness where I don't think joy has been perverted in the same way. And so where happiness in my mind becomes more fleeting and transient joy, you can still be joyous when, you know, you're cut off in the car and, and you can still be joyous when things don't go your way. You can still be, can still hold on and radiate joy when, um, because it's, there's more of a, a sense of, of permanence to it. No, because I've honestly, I've always seen, um, happiness and joy to be almost the exact same thing. So to hear, Another definition of it being two different concepts is, so how would you go ahead and define what joy is then? I mean, I think it's more of a, a state of being as opposed to just a fleeting feeling. It's not just a, a sentiment. Joy is, uh, it's more core, it's more foundational, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think happiness I associate it with just some, that, something that's more fleeting and more superficial. Okay. So with 
happiness with how you're sort of describing happiness. I, I think I, when you said overrated, I was very, very happy that you said that because I, I kind of do agree when it comes to happiness. I do think it is fleeting because I know whenever people ask also, what do you want to do in life or what do you want to be in life? People always somehow find a way to say, oh, I want to be happy. And that probably annoys me the most because when it comes to being ha- to be doing being happy to actually being happy there's a lot of things that you need to do in order to be happy and when they say i want to be happy okay so but how do you want to be happy how do you want to how do you want to be productive in that do you want um like i see happiness as a very much of a momentary sort of occasion like okay i'm happy for a little moment and then suddenly I go back to being completely docile, I go back to being totally robotic in doing certain things. And then I'm happy again, and then I'm down, and then I'm happy again. So it's it's always something that makes you happy rather than I am actually happy. Yeah, I think what you're describing is the fleeting nature of happiness. Uh, happy is a feeling, right? Like it's it's... I want to be happy. And and I think our world is designed in such a way where it's just, a, it, it's, <laughs> it's always just out of your reach. Like you're always just trying to get it and you get a little glimpse of it. You know, you can like taste it and then it goes away. It, it was just like you're saying. And, and I think it's, um, it, it, that's why I, I think it's important to distinguish between the two uh, and, and joy it is, you know, it's, 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 it's things that are, are worth suffering for, right? Like joy is, is something that you, you know, it, it's, I don't know how to describe it other than it's much deeper than happiness and, and lots and lots and lots of different things can make you happy, but only the things that you're really passionate about, that you really care about, that you really value, bring you joy. Yeah, no, I can definitely see see the difference, especially when it comes to how you're describing how joy is. There's a lot of joyous moments, but there's momentary happiness. So, I so when you're saying it like that, that's how I'm sort of thinking about it. When you t- especially when you talk in terms of, I mean, the upcoming holiday of Christmas coming up. There's it's a lot of joyous moments. It's a joyous time, but it's never. There's not that doesn't usually have to be a happy moment or happy moments or happiness unless you get Christmas presents and you're passing Christmas presents around. That's when everyone's happy. But the joy is actually a whole lot deeper than that, that you're actually feeling joy. So so I think it's from what I'm sort of understanding, it's kind of a step further than just being happy. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So when it comes to the journey of, Self, self-acceptance. And I know that's what we're here talking about today. So how does self-acceptance contribute to reduce workplace bias? Um, I think this goes in the Percipio company, we've, we've created very defined milestones to try to measure belonging mm-hmm. uh, in the workplace. And the first one I alluded to it earlier, it's identity, it's who you are and really knowing who you are, what your values are, what your morals are, what things are you willing to fight for? What will you die for? Uh, We don't spend enough time really trying to figure that out. And, and so once you get as close as you can, because I think it's also an, a lifelong journey of, of allowing your identity to grow and evolve and change. And, and, you know, if, if, if you don't have that kind of lifelong learner mindset, then you're inevitably going to get stuck somewhere along the way. And the, the next piece of that, right. Is like, once you, once you go on that journey, there are going to be some things about yourself that you'll discover that you truly love and you'll never let go of. And then there's other things that, you know, 
maybe you don't like and you don't want to accept and you want to change. And that process is implicit in that process is self-acceptance, right? You really can't know yourself. You can't accept yourself until you embrace those dark sides of yourself. Like who, what are the demons that vex you? Like what are your insecurities? What are your things that you're truly afraid of? And, you know, not in a, uh, you know, made up kind of way. Uh, so I think really going on that journey of, of introspection, self-reflection, the, the bias framework that I use is just used to do just that, is to get people going through a self-reflective process so they, they can understand themselves in a different way, see themselves in a different way, and then align what their skills are with a role within an organization. So what is somebody really passionate about? Is it writing? Well, okay, well, now we can put you in a role where you can really spend your waking hours and your focus writing. If it's, you know, stitching, is it videotaping? Is it doing film? Is it uh, manufacturing things? Is it digging holes? Is it construction? Is it flying pl Whatever it might be. It's, it's, it's really getting you aligned into the, into the role that aligns with your identity. Okay, so it's not fitting the person into the role, it's fitting the role into the person. Uh, I think it's reciprocal, right? It's not, uh, it's not one way. One, yeah. The moment that you decided to be a podcast host, that mm -hmm. role changed who you are. And you had to grow into that role to become as good as you are at doing it. That's true. Okay. Yeah. No, that makes, that makes a whole lot more sense now. And I know like within your company, I was looking into it a little bit and the motto that you're trying to live behind or the belief system that you're going through is if you have a brain, you have a bias. And when I read that, I was like, that's true. We're naturally, we are naturally biased in a sense of so many different circumstances. And I do want to know what exactly you meant by what exactly is the definition of workplace bias? Oh, uh, <laughs> the definition of workplace bias. Um, well, there's, there's three different types of biases that are found in every workplace. Okay. The first is biases born out of the way our brains process information. And so the belief you were referring to, if you have a brain, you have bias. I actually trademarked that as uh, um, a, a premise that I, in, I start my consulting engagements on. So if you have a brain, you have bias, opens us up to a conversation around decision-making and the biases that are part of a decision-making process. There's lots of research now that shows uh, our brains have a lot of biases that are a byproduct of just how we process information. Cognitive biases are burgeoning. There's well over 200 named cognitive biases. Mm -hmm. And so in any day, any given time, in any given workplace, if people are using their brains, there's going to be bias. So there's one type of bias in the workplace, right? Okay. The other is related to social constructs. And social constructs, gender, race, culture, age, uh, orientation, religion, politics, media, like all of these different types of, of social constructs have biases that are associated with them. And those, that grouping also impacts every workplace, right? There's gender bias in the workplace. And this is where you get dangerously close to uh, laws being broken, right? Laws that involve equity and equality. And, um, and, and so I think social biases also impact every workplace. And the key there is identifying the behavior that's associated with that type of bias. 
Social biases are best measured by behaviors. Cognitive biases are not because we all think crazy stuff at any given moment of any given day. And so to be judged against a fleeting thought, I think that's part of where the errors come into play. Behaviors we can control. So if you're acting in a biased way towards women, men, uh, people of different colors, orientations, whatever, then that's problematic. But if, because it's those behaviors over time, if they don't get addressed, then you get systemic biases or institutionalized biases. And once a bias becomes baked into a process within an organization, you've got a real, real problem. Because now that that's the third component of what I call the bias ecosystem. And every workplace is a bias ecosystem. It's really a matter of figuring out what types of biases are guiding the behaviors of everyone collectively in that workplace. Okay. So there's, there, it is a, a lot of information for me to pick up. Um, so, no, because it's really fascinating, because especially when you're talking about the long-term effects of workplace bias when it comes to the institutionalized bias. And when you think about reviews that go up on for other employees to sort of see being like, okay, this is not a female helpful environment. This is not a, this is a very male oriented company where they're very focused on the whole, okay, if you're a man, you're going to go far. So there's going to be a lot of reviews that sort of indicate and result to a lot of the institutional bias. So when it comes to your own experiences and sort of dealing in the work that you do, how does self-acceptance sort of pave the way for individuals to find that self sense of belonging and both in their personal or even in their professional setting? So it's that, you know, the first step of self-reflection, right? Mm -hmm. And I intentionally start with cognitive biases because they're universal, right? It doesn't matter what race, gender, culture, age. If you have a brain, you have bias. That's universal. So that becomes a great way for you to start to reflect and see how bias has been impacting the decisions that you've made in your life. And that gives you a different lens, a different way to, to start to evaluate the choices that you've made, right? And 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 in, in that process, that's where you gain greater self-acceptance because you're coming to a deeper truth about how you got to be where you are right now. Okay. So, and what role does it play in creating a harmonious sort of workplace culture? Yeah, I think... Um, Harmony is a, uh, a very elusive word um, because sometimes in the nature of the work that's, that's done today, there needs to be a certain amount of, of creative tension in order for innovation to take place, in order for productivity to take place. So I, I think when people, um, you know, are, are, When the, when, when, the, when the companies that I work with are embracing this model, the result is, uh, is, is more harmony because we're, you know, we're going through most of the process to deepen our understanding of one another and how to support one another and lift each other up. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a, a game of scarcity, right? It's not a game of like, I win, you lose. It's not a game of, uh, in the modern workplace, inside of a company, it's much, much, much more about how do we lift each other up? How do we support one another? How do we get things done in a more, you know, it, it's not even as much about how to be more efficient because I think we've spent the last 25, 30, 40 years optimizing processes to be very efficient. Like that's a given. I mean, that's just, that's just a default programming. What really differentiates companies now is not 
you know, the, the, the what that they're doing, but the how that they're doing it, right? And how are you really engaging uh, a group of people, right? It's, it's about how you're, how you're feeling as you're going through something. So it's not drudgery and, and a chore. It's, it's a, it's a labor of love. Okay. So there is a such thing as sort of a healthy competition amongst different employees. So when you talk about like the harmonious aspect to it, there's still that, okay, there's still that friendly competition that can sort of go about who has the most innovative idea or who has the best way of doing something. So it still is motivating, but it's not um, making anyone feel like they're not capable of doing anything. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think when you have a high degree of self-acceptance, you have great losers. You have great people who uh, can are, are capable of making mistakes, who are empowered to make mistakes. When you have high degrees of self-acceptance, people know they're not defined by, uh, you know, somebody else winning, right? They're, they don't feel this intrinsic sense of loss right? They can actually, it, it's, it's, it's more of like happiness. <laughs> it's more fleeting. It, it can be let go of because I can take joy in you winning. And next time I'm going to kick your ass, but this time it's okay. You know, we can, you know, we can truly gather around and celebrate that as a, as a victory for the whole company. You know what I mean? It's not just about you. Yeah. And I think like when it comes to that idea and that sort of way about a workplace, when I'm sort of thinking about it, I'm trying to relate it back to university days where everyone sort of had those different competitions. Everyone had the like assignments that were still, even though we weren't trying to beat each other, we were still trying to beat each other. And we were still trying to not get the best grade, but have the most well-edited video or have the most um, cast in one film or di different things. And it was always that idea of, we we're just trying to still trying to build each other up. We weren't trying to say, okay, I'm better than you. I have the best editing skills. We were saying, okay, I can do this, but you can definitely do that part better. Or we're trying to like build off of each other. And it was great because that conflict also prepared us quite well for how the workplace is gonna be or how a workplace, a healthy workplace should be. And it allowed us to sort of have that impact of understanding that this is my skills. I'm good at this, but I'm not good at this. And that's something like video editing is definitely not one of my high things. It's definitely never anything that I want to get into ever again. But I had experience in it because I learned from that, or I had some view into it where I tried it. And yes, I failed at that part, but I did so many other parts of it well. And that was the way that I sort of felt, okay, I can do this, but I can definitely improve now that I have this job, for example, now that I'm working as a podcaster, I can sort of build on my skills of talking to people a whole lot more, which is something that I thrive in a whole lot better. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that gets you to having a, a sense of agency. And I think that that's the second cornerstone of belonging in how I've defined belonging. It's identity, agency, power, and flow. And, and agency is just what you described. Like you're, you found the role that aligns with your skills, your values, what you're passionate about. And you're not only comfortable in that role, but you're confident in that role. And that's when you have a high degree of agency. So, you know, the goal is to get greater self-acceptance so that you can get in the right role and have high degrees of agency in that role. Mm -hmm. No, see, when you're saying it like that, it makes so much sense because it, it makes me understand exactly the way that it's supposed to feel. You're supposed to feel confident in the role that you can do, but also know that there's still things that you need to learn. And I mean, when it comes to the workplace environment, like we were talking about earlier, there's that bouncing off other people, there's learning from other people around you. And when they say you learn on the job, you really do learn on the job, no matter what 
job you go into, whether you start off sort of running a company or whether you're starting from the ground zero, you're still building off of what other people know. And that whole idea of self-acceptance, if you can't take criticism as well, that's also another thing that sort of probably puts down a lot of your own self-acceptance, your own self-worth in the workplace. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and I think there's a correlation between the amount of self-acceptance you have and the amount of criticism that you're able to bear. Mm -hmm. And people who have high degrees of self-acceptance welcome criticism. They welcome, you know, feedback because it's not, you know, it's not internalized. It's not a reflection of their self-worth. So when it comes to the whole idea of self-acceptance and sort of accepting how you are, how does that influence your overall happiness? Uh, well, I think if, if by overall happiness, you mean like, uh, how I was defining a state of joy, um, something that has a little more permanence to it, uh, something that's not dependent on, you know, daily transactions or the amount of, you know, coffee that you've had in the morning or something like that. Um, in the, the, the first part of the question was what? So could you elaborate on some of the psychological impact of self-acceptance on an individual's mental well-being? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'll start with the last part of what you just said, the mental well-being. Okay. Um, I think that there's been a conflating, a confusion about mental illness, about, uh, you know, like psychological disorders with mental well being. And I think it's taking longer because the, the collective understanding of what mental well being is, is still tightly coupled with mental illness. And so people don't really want to deepen their understanding of what mental well-being is, what emotional well-being is, what, uh, you know, what that means to, to y you as a person in the workplace. I think, um, we're, we're still struggling with defining what that is. And, and once we do define what mental well-being is, what emotional well-being is, like what it means to be emotionally supported in the workplace, that's when we have more psychologically safe environments. That's when people aren't afraid to make mistakes. That's when, you know, managers are looking for barriers, systemic barriers that they can remove to allow their employees to be more productive rather than trying to put in controls to figure out how to extract more something out of this little bit of time that they have, like get something done faster, smarter, whatever. And so I think there's a lot of shifting that's taking place right now. And it's correlated to um, having a high degree of self-acceptance and getting yourself into a role in an organization that you're really passionate about, that you're, you're really willing to um, dedicate yourself to. Okay. And now we're looking into some of the practices that you can do with some of some practical strategies that's going to take place. Now, do you have any that you would recommend for individuals who are striving for self-acceptance, especially in contexts where a workplace bias might challenge the process? Yes, I think um, it, it really depends if it's a, if it's an individual uh, who's looking to make change in their workplace and there's a lot of systemic barriers um, and they don't have a, a high degree of, of power in their, in their work context. So remember the, the third cornerstone for a culture of belonging is power. Uh, it goes from identity to agency to power and power is 
this very elusive but very present sense of what you can do and can't do like who makes the decisions in the organization and you know how do they uh present themselves in different contexts and and so i think for an individual who doesn't have any type of authority or power in an organization and they're feeling like they you know are are uh you know that 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 they're that they're being biased against and that there's uh there isn't anyone that's going to hear them or listen to them mm-hmm. in that kind of extreme situation get out <laughs> just go find an i mean stay as long as you can to you know keep your finances going but you know just find a different place that really does align with who you are mm-hmm. more often than not it's a it, it's a different scenario where it's not just a individual contributor at an organization that doesn't have any advocates or allies within the organization to help them. It's, it's more of, um, you know, a systemic, uh, or, or people, people in positions of power who can affect change, right? Those types of people, people who have decision-making ability, or at least can influence how things get done in an organization. Those are the folks that need to really go about the business of De- demystifying, destigmatizing, and dismantling the biases that exist in that workplace. Mm-hmm. It's it's a really fascinating topic because there's a lot of, especially in this day and age today, and I have this discussion with my friends quite often when it comes to workplaces. So when it comes to that job in particular that is willing to take someone with barely any experience how do you, how do we stay at that job if it's not going to really be beneficial for us, but we know that it's a job that's going to gain us some experience? I would say if it, if it's a job that's going to give you experience, that is the benefit. Okay. And it, it's the experience that you need in order to find you know, a, a, what you're going to perceive is a better job somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of it is just your perception and the biases that you bring to bear at that point, you know, when you're leaving university, you're still, uh, you know, believing in the Dr. Seuss book, like, oh, the places you'll go, the endless possibility, like that's the, and I think that's part of the, you know, the, the, the bias in your thinking is that 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 next job is going to you know that you can co- go into it and have a greater impact than what that that company may be ready for mm-hmm. maybe you do have the greatest idea that ever happened according to your limited vantage point your limited perspective because you have no experience. They could have, you know, already lost thousands of dollars pursuing that that same idea 10 years ago when you weren't even thinking of work post uni yet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's there's always a lot more to the picture and, you know, I think you know, people coming into a university, they're better served really trying to find the people that have been there longer periods of time that have, that are very strong influencers or decision makers, and then figuring out some excuse to get in close proximity with them. Mm-hmm. And then just trying to, you know, learn from them, ask them to be your mentor, ask them to be your advocate. And suddenly that that can change everything, right? Like you don't suddenly this play, the perception of that place changes a hundred percent. And okay. it's uh it's just one strategy that I think is underutilized by people coming into a job. I think networking is probably one of the most the most difficult things to do, but also it's the most beneficial I've I've found in the recent years. Yeah, yeah. And there's a bias that that inhibits networking. It's called like me bias we automatically gravitate towards people who are 
like us. And so if it's the new new employees, right? You're, you're literally clumped together by the system because that's the process. We have all the people, we're gonna onboard them together. And, and, and so, you know, that's who you end up going to lunch with. That's who you end up hanging out with. That's who you end up going to happy hour with. And you're missing out on networking with other people who are not like you. Mm -hmm. And that's the, you know, that, that's the, the bias that needs to be disrupted early and often. Okay. Oh, it's, I think the whole idea of bias is really starting to make sense to me now, which is great because at the beginning it was something that I had to Google, especially when it came to a workplace environment. I think workplace bias, I didn't think was a huge thing on the employee side, more so on the employer side, but it's just as strong, I guess, on the employee aspect of how they sort of have expectations sort of held within the company. Employees have brains, employees have bias. Okay. See, I, I love I love that phrase now. It's it's annoying that you've trademarked it because I want to say it every day. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna go on really quickly to our practice and habit part of the show, which is some of your own practices that you do yourself. Now what is a practice that you do to improve your own self-acceptance and boost your own joy? I love that you use joy. Um, uh, I think um, daily reflection. Uh, so in the morning I do um, a breathing exercise uh, and it just helps me get centered. And uh, periodically throughout the day I may I, I may take 60 seconds and just do another breathing exercise just to get centered. Mm -hmm. But those, those, uh, that, that singular practice is, um, is something that helps keep me grounded in joy. Um, okay. the other, I mean, other things that I can think of that improve my self-acceptance are just really going out of my way to foster and, and, and strengthen relationships with people that are going to, um, give me candid feedback that are, that are going to hold me accountable that, uh, you know, are going to give me a perspective on things that I can't see. And, um, and so I think that's only, I'm only able to seek that out because I have a very deep sense of who I am. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, it's amazing. I love the the breathing exercise in the morning. And I think um, if Lou were here, she would definitely say that she does the same thing as well. So that is that is great to hear that it's, it's a really popular thing to keep going. And, you know, I definitely hear her talking about it often. So I think that is, it's such a great practice that I've heard doing and I, wish I could say that I, I do it. I love to believe that I breathe enough in the morning, but I cannot sit still for the life of me. So there, there's different practices that I definitely do enjoy. And I think I tried the breathing, but it just, it didn't fit right with me. So yeah, I, the journaling that you mentioned earlier, I think I do, I do quite often, but yeah, breathing is something that I don't really find myself doing quite often, which is probably why I'm as tense as can be, but we're not going to deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's one, one of the practices that I do both uh, in my personal and professional life is, you know, identify these things that are happening outside of our conscious awareness. Breathing is one of them. Breathing, it just is happening. Um, maybe you could try just like like feeling your heartbeat and just holding that for 10 seconds and counting how many times it beats, right? Maybe it's something else that is part of your automatic like default programming that just happens outside of your conscious awareness. Identify something and then just bring it into your conscious awareness. And that exercise can be 
jarring. It can be surprising. It can be enlightening and it can bring you more joy. It keeps you grounded. Okay. So doing something because you know that you do it often or that's the first thing that you do or just acknowledge, I guess what you're saying is acknowledge that's what you do. Um, I, I think even more specific than that, identify something that you do on a daily basis without thinking about it. So brushing okay. your teeth, maybe that's one, right? Okay. You don't necessarily, I, I would imagine uh, you, you know, you get a toothbrush and then your other hand get toothpaste and then you apply it, but you're not issuing like conscious commands. It's not like, you know, like you're saying, right hand, go grab toothbrush, left hand, you know, squeeze. It's automatic. Mm -hmm. But I think simple acts like that, if you just make them conscious and you just go through that process, mm -hmm. something about it changes. It just gets you more focused because our brains are so wired to just go to the next crazy thing, like all over the place. You know, mm -hmm. you think about a thousand things while you're brushing your teeth other than brushing your teeth. Same thing with eating, like eating food. Like just the next time that you have a very savory meal, actually take the time to just enjoy all of the flavors of one bite, right? If you're having a glass of wine, like just smell it first, like just turn that whole thing into a production in your own mind mm -hmm. of what was just an unconscious, yeah, give me, done. And, and it's amazing what that can do. Like it just gets your, you know, we have a very limited conscious window and much more of what's going on in our world is unconscious. And, and so it's any opportunity that you can to draw that, that what's happening unconscious under the hood into your conscious realm. Wow. It can just change things. It, it just, it gives you more, a, a, just a greater sense of, of who you are, what you're doing. Okay. Well, I'm definitely going to be trying that a whole lot more tomorrow and see, I'll definitely see how that goes. Cause that sounds, it just sounds like it's going to be a lot more present inducing rather than thinking about so many things all at the same time. Absolutely. And, and you know, you don't have to, you, you, you can't do it all day long, right? <laughs> you can't, <laughs> but you can give yourself those little brief moments. And the more frequently you can do that, wow, you know, I've just found it to be so grounding and so joyous. Okay, perfect. I'm definitely going to try that tomorrow and we'll see how that goes as a little, it's a little change into my morning, little morning routine that I have got going. We'll see how that goes. Now that sounds, it sounds interesting. So I'm, I love trying little, little experiments. So I'll definitely give that a go tomorrow. Fantastic. Now, this leads in perfectly to the last section of the show, which is our open mic. Now, this gives you a chance to talk about anything that you are passionate about, that you feel you want the audience to know, or it could be something relating to the topic that we didn't get to talk about. Um, so in the last minute or so, I'd love to give you the floor and share what's on your mind today. Oh, my goodness. Um Much of this uh, interview, podcast, recording, whatever you want to call it, has been, you know, about finding little things that we can reframe and redefine, whether it be distinguishing between happiness and joy or finding those moments of, of unconscious behaviors, things that we do on autopilot, and then making them very intentional and on pilot. That practice is one that I, I get organizations to do. So rather than just go into a meeting and run it the same way that you've run a meeting every time and expect different results, like let's truly find a different way to do it. Let's find a way to get everybody to be more present with one another, to put the device down to, you know, to really be intentional about how you're going to be experiencing somebody else, right? Deep listening, um, not listening for something that you want to hear, uh, not 
you know, just waiting until the person finishes their thoughts so you can insert whatever you have and going through your head, right? Like, 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 like getting away from those uh, very conditioned behaviors and, uh, and really trying to, you know, bring what's both individually unconscious to the conscious front and then collectively as well, like how, how organizations do what they do often this process results in dramatic changes in, in processes. Sometimes people get, we do reorganizations and realignments and, and, you know, move people to different teams. And it's, it's really simple, but profound what can happen when you, uh, when you engage in this activity. Mm -hmm. No, that sounds, it sounds very, um, it sounds very easy. And as a concept being like, okay, we're going to, everyone's going to be around each other. Everyone's going to put their phones down, but the actual like practice of sitting there and really listening. I mean, I'm sitting here and I'm interviewing guests after guests and I'm trying to find a place to reply in without really listening to it until I listen to it back after the recording, just to see the concepts that we sort of understood that we sort of spoke about. And there's actually so much to learn once you really get down and really listen to it. And I'm definitely an example of that because I sit here and asking question and thinking about what to rebuttal of the conversation that we just had until I, after I look back at it again, that's when I really start understanding what's going on, really start understanding the conversation that we speak about because I'm so busy trying to get the job done rather than actually really wanting to hear other people. So having that concept of just taking that time to really sit down and really be present and really listen is not an easy concept. It's not an easy thing to put into practice, especially for a company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and here, I'm going to give you this that you can take to the other parental and family podcast uh, that you are uh, very you know, comfortable in. Parents, any parent listening, so many parents are guilty of not only listening, not listening to their, to their teenage children and, and just having them pigeonholed into what they think they need to be, as opposed to really listening for who their kids are in that moment. And I think from a parent perspective, it's infused with a lot of fear. Like they don't want to, you know, they're afraid of, of what their kids might become. And so they want to hold on to this thing. Like you have to go to university, you have to become a doctor, you have to be a lawyer, whatever it might be, as opposed to really just listening deeply to where the, the, the child is right now. And, uh, it doesn't mean that you can't guide them in that direction or, or even hope that they go in the direction that you think they need to go, but it's, uh, it's an exercise. It's a deep listening exercise that I think a lot of parents uh, struggle with. Yes. Well, you definitely would like the parenting show then, because that's definitely what we talk about almost every episode in how much a child is seen and never heard. So it's a, it's a very interesting concept. And I think it fits into every kind of scenario when it comes to relationships, whether it's workplace or parent and child or one individual to another, it's always listening to reply rather than listening to really listen. So it's it's a practice that I think is really difficult for everyone. And it's a practice that I think we all, I feel we all should try to be a bit more aware of because I don't th think a lot of people are aware of it. But yeah, no, it's a, it's a very interesting practice to try to put into play every single time you have a conversation. Well, you can't do it every time you have a conversation. No. <laughs> Some conversations are very transactional in nature, but, you know, more often than not, we need to listen to understand first. And then, you know, we can, w once we clarify that we really understand one another, you know, that's the, that's the basis for love. That's the basis for productivity. That's the basis for innovation. Like it's the basis for so many things. <laughs> No, that's very true. And that's such a great way for us to end the show today. And 
end the conversation and hopefully definitely not end the practice of trying to be a bit more self-aware and a bit more self-accepting with oneself. And also, I think know your worth is probably a great takeaway for today's episode when especially dealing with in the workplace. I think it's important for everyone to sort of know how worthy they are of the skills that they have or just the person that they are as well. So thank you so much, Matthew, for joining me on the show today and for talking about this. I think I've learned so much and I learned so much more than Google could ever show me. Um, So I definitely appreciate that. Well, that's good because Google is now on steroids and it's called BARD. Uh, Chat GTP and Bard are now uh, have, have 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 really the, the the burgeoning area of my practice is mitigating bias in artificial intelligence. Uh, even the name artificial intelligence is such a misleading characterization of an algorithm and a large data set, and uh, and then what can be done with that. And there's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of, of, of bias that's baked into those. And that is something that I'm going to be uh, focusing on starting all now and on into 2024. Oh, wow. Well, that's this is the perfect time to sort of be into that and share some of the bias with everyone. I think AI is probably where everyone is going into now. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> For, for better or worse? Better or worse. We don't know that yet. <laughs> so if our listeners want to find out a little bit more about you, is there a place they're able to go to to learn a bit more? Uh, the best place is the Percipio Company website. And it is, that's the domain, Percipio Company, P-E-R-C-I-P-I-O company.com. And there it's a rich playground of tools and resources and assessments. And uh, if any of that intrigues you in any meaningful way, there's a contact uh, page on there. So that's the easiest way to get a hold of me. Perfect. Well, thank you so much again, Matthew, for joining me on the show today. And I hope the audience learned as much as I did when it comes to trying to be self-aware, trying to be a whole lot of different concepts that we learned today that I am now trying to Google and try to remember. But thank you so much for joining me today. And I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. I'll see you all in the next episode. You have been listening to Sarah Boost, the Happiness Science Insights podcast produced by the Happiness Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes are available from 10 Life Management Perspectives and can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and other podcasting apps available on your devices. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, share, and subscribe to our channel so that other people can find it and we can continue to provide quality content. More of our work can be found on our website, ha.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Lungo. Thanks for tuning in. 